There's one particular lyric in this show that gets repeated very often, and it's seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. And yet, even after seeing this show last week, I can scarcely believe it. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. If you're meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe. I'm obsessed with all things theatre, and I am a professional theatre critic here in the UK. I'm also a content creator here on YouTube. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my channel. You can become a member at the link below if you want to see my videos before everybody else does, and you can go and find me on other social media platforms, at Mickey Joe Theatre. Today we are going to be talking all about Aspects of Love, the brand new revival of this Andrew Lloyd Webber composed show which has just opened at the Lyric Theatre in London's West End. It stars its original breakout star Michael Ball, now playing a different role to the one which he originally played, but still singing the very famous song Love Changes Everything. And for a lot of people this may be all you know about this show, but today let me tell you, you are going to learn an awful lot more about Aspects of Love, because this musical is wild. There's a part of me that still isn't really sure why this show is being produced in 2023, but there's another part of me that's hugely grateful for it, because I feel like there are a lot of people who didn't understand that Bad Cinderella, or just Cinderella, was not the first ever strange show that Andrew Lloyd Webber was participatory in. For decades now, he has been composing shows about singing cats and singing trains, and sometimes people who really just want to bang each other. So we're going to be talking all about that today. I'm going to do my best to explain the plot of this show to you, which is going to be so much fun. If you have wine nearby, I'd suggest drinking it now. And I'm going to tell you why the audience reaction to this show on press night was so the opposite of what it ought to have been. We are going to talk about all of that today in my full review, right after this sneak peek of the opening night curtain call. Obviously there are going to be plenty of spoilers in this section, some very big things happen in this plot. If you do not want spoilers for this show, if you want to be surprised, then that's a choice that you're making, trust me, but feel free to skip ahead to the next section. So how to explain the plot of Aspects of Love? Buckle up for this one, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to keep this as a visual aid. We first meet these characters here. This is Rose, she is an actress in a terrible play, she's not thrilled about that. And this is Alex, an 18 year old man who visits her backstage in her dressing room and convinces her romantically to run away with him to his villa, which it transpires is actually his uncle's villa, but he doesn't tell her that to begin with. No, you don't tell that to the older actress you're trying to pull, come on now. His uncle, Georges, gets wind of this while he is staying with his mostly inconsequential mistress, Julietta, and goes back to his villa in order to surprise the lovers. During this visit, he manages to charm Rose, and after Alex comes back from war a few years later, he finds out that Rose is now his uncle's mistress. Understandably shocked by this, he shoots her. Her. Literally, he threatens to kill her and then like mistakenly shoots her in the arm instead. His uncle George returns to witness the aftermath of this, complains that he's shot his one genuine painting, and then immediately launches into a song about how Alex would be a much better romantic fit for Rose, the woman he's just shot. This is objectively one of the strange moments of the show because George has such a strange grasp on the situation where he's coming back to see a literal gunshot wound and immediately thinks, you know what, you two are meant to be together. Like, I don't know how you misread the room to that extent. I think this is when Alex goes back to war, which is kind of his go-to whenever anything isn't going well. Rose, meanwhile, chases George across Europe to his mistress Julietta's residence. They subsequently get married. Julietta turns up at the wedding and makes out with Rose at the altar. The guests and George are all thrilled about this. Everybody applauds for this impromptu moment of lesbianism. And then we have this 12 year time jump taking us into the second act. Once again, we have Rose backstage at a play, only now it's hugely successful and she is doing very well, which is good because George has just lost all of his money uh, because of plot reasons. Alex once again visits her backstage where she ousts her new lover Hugo because she only has one space in the car that she's taking back to her husband's residence. So, 
obviously you don't take your new lover, obviously you take your former lover who is also his nephew. Like that's, that's, that's the obvious thing to do in that situation. But when they get back to the house, we meet Jenny, which is this couple's 12 year old daughter and his cousin, his first cousin, because George is the brother of his mother. And Jenny is quite enchanted by the 30 year old man who has arrived at her home. And over the course of this second act, we see the two of them becoming uncomfortably close. We have another little bit of an age jump that sees Jenny turning from a child actress into an adult actress, at which point we actually start to call a spade a spade and the two admit that they have feelings for each other, feelings that they can't act on because Jenny is inappropriately young. She is 18 in this version because it's been updated from the 15 that she used to be while all of this was going on. And the fact that their cousins meanwhile doesn't seem to be an issue for either of them. Literal blood relatives, but that's not a problem. Now, after a very tense night at the circus where the two of them are getting too close and George, who has begun to cotton on to this, is getting understandably vexed by it, he witnesses them embracing and kissing, promptly bursts into the room, has a heart attack and dies. The next thing we see is George's funeral, where per his own request, Julietta is giving a speech about living life to the full. Rose literally chucks his ashes over all of the guests. And then these two characters finally meet, Julietta and Alex. She asks him if he's still going around shooting women, which is a fair question, except for the fact that three sentences later, the two of them leave together to go and have sex on a hay bale during the funeral of his uncle. Literally, I wish I was lying to you, but this is what happens in this show. Alex goes back to the house and tells Jenny that they can't be together. Rose then begs him to stay, not for Jenny, but for her, because she literally can't bear to be alone. Alex tells her he just can't. Julietta wanders back on, asks aloud what's going to happen with Jenny, and then the four of them stand there. Meanwhile, the show, not knowing what to do, abruptly ends. Literally, that is the plot of Aspects of Love. And if it sounds like I'm making fun of it and embellishing somewhat, I'm actually not. I'm, this is literally, what happens in this show. I told you it was wild. Now, I've seen a lot of fans of this show saying that people just aren't ready for this kind of a plot in 2023, and perhaps that's right, and we'll talk a little bit more about the ick factor of it all. However, I need you to know that I knew this plot going in. I knew the full extents of the strangeness of this plot, and I was ready to embrace the wildness of it all. However, I was still surprised by what actually happened when I saw the show. So this production does a handful of things well. Obviously it sounds very stirring and very rapturous. It has a fuller orchestra than most shows. I believe it retains its original orchestrations. And you have four or five sweeping melodies that come around like buses in quiet traffic. And if five strong tunes do not an entire quality score make, then nobody has ever told Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber that. It also looks fantastic. We do have a little bit of an over-reliance on projections, especially when reenacting the scenes where Laura Pulford's character Rose is acting in plays. You have this huge ensemble. I don't know why they don't actually show those on stage. Instead, we are projecting pre-filmed uh, acting sequences in a theatre rather than using the theatre we're actually in. On opening night, the audio for this did not line up whatsoever, and the whole thing felt very cold and stilted. It was just a very strange way to open the first and second act. But once we get into it, we have some decent set pieces. It starts very black box with a dressing room that comes forward and a little corridor leading off to the side. We have an entire train compartment that comes forward that isn't used again after that. And we have these screens that roll across the front of the stage, allowing set pieces and actors to change behind them, which is very clever. Again, we have projection going onto those that seems to accompany this sort of cinematic tone with which the show has been directed because we have these establishing shots of canals and city landscapes. When we actually get to George's villa, then we have some gorgeous hand-painted backdrops and such and a gauze curtain that comes down. Those look very lush, if a little bit misguided because there is so much talk of mountains that we never really see. We get forest, we don't get mountains. But I do think it's a really strong design for this show. I also think it's a very lush costume design. The one issue I have is that the pre-show setup and curtain is just black. It's the most boring pre-show curtain I've ever seen in my life, but that's very far down the list of issues that I have with this show. So like I said before, I knew that the plot was wild. It's not that I'm taken aback by the strangeness of this plot. My enduring feeling is that this was just not a good production of this show, even aside from the material. Even if you think that this is a great show, this was not a production that did that justice because so much of it 
didn't land. There were so many comedy moments that were not funny. There were so many dramatic and sad moments that got huge laughs. On so many levels and in so many different ways, it just wasn't successful for me. I'm going to elaborate in great detail about why this was, but I really struggled to enjoy this show. And I don't know who is enjoying this show. I don't know what this is meant to be doing for audiences. Just looking at this material on paper, I don't know if it's meant to uplift, inspire. I don't know if it's meant to be romantic or particularly hot. I, I just don't get what this show is meant to be doing. And by some coincidence, I have walked past the Lyric Theatre now three times when the audience has been coming out. And it's not like you see a sea of smiles. You see this sort of bemused expression because the way that the show ends is, is just bizarre. I don't think anyone's bursting into tears. I don't think anyone is charmed or delighted by it. I literally have no idea how this show is meant to leave people. But there is so much more I wanna say about it. So why don't I tell you a little bit more about why I thought this show didn't work. So I think if there is a good show in there somewhere, it is all about this central quartet of characters. I don't think we need all of the grandeur around it. And it was written at a time where I think people expected that from their musicals. This was the first show that Andrew Lloyd Webber had worked on since The Phantom of the Opera. He was collaborating again with that lyricist Charles Hart, as well as with Don Black. And with this being another rapturous sweeping romance, I think perhaps there was the inclination to go big and West End. But for this show, really, at the heart of it, I think it ought to be a smaller chamber musical. I regret never having seen the more intimate production that was staged off West End at Southwark Playhouse a few years ago, because I would have been very intrigued to see how it would play in a smaller setting. We have all of these big scenes with this massive, incredibly underutilized ensemble, literally one of the most underutilized ensembles I think I've ever seen. They could almost be supernumeraries who are paid less because they don't have to speak on stage. They do sing occasionally, but other than the few of them that have a couple of lines here and there, they mostly just come on stage to give the effect of a crowd. But I also just didn't really feel a lot of romance in this show. This show is famous for the song Love Changes Everything. Love is right there in the title. And I don't know if I believed that many of these pairings were in love. I buy the affection between Laura Pitt Pulford's Rose and Michael Bull's George. That one I get. But I don't know if I get love from uh, Jamie Boggio's Alex. I definitely get love from Jenny in the second act, but that's a whole mess of its own. And Julietta, meanwhile, is just vibing and having amorous relations with everyone that she meets. Honestly, it starts to feel a lot more like Aspect of Lust. These characters aren't particularly likable, and there's no enduring message from it all. I don't think anyone learns anything. They just go about their lives. There are these sections where they're dancing around with the gauze in front of them. This happens in the first and second act, and they're singing in French, and the plot just basically stops, and the show has no pace for that moment. There's next to no subplot, because nothing is ever happening without all of these characters being in the same place, and none of them seem to have anything else going on in their lives other than these relationships. Or if they do, we just don't explore that. Alex goes to war and this never really gets talked about. Rose goes on to have a promising acting career and we really don't explore that. And then I think we have to talk about this Jenny problem because yes, they have increased her age from 15 to 18 in this version. So it doesn't feel like out and out amoral and illegal, but it still feels for want of a better word, icky. And I'll tell you why. First of all, they are first cousins and he meets her when she's a young child. So it does still feel like any relationship they will go on to have looks an awful lot like grooming. And I just think if changing her age from 15 to 18 is the only thing they thought they needed to do to make this fine, then it speaks to just a seriously misguided perspective. First of all, it would have been so easy to just not make them blood relatives. George has a line where he says, why did my sister have to have a son? And also, why did she have to move to Maine? This ostensibly seems to have been put into the show to justify the fact that Jamie Boggio has an American accent and doesn't seem to be able to do an English one. But George also has a late wife. Now, if it was his wife's sister who had had a son, that would make Jenny and Alex not at all blood related, which would obviously be better, but it wouldn't fix all the problem because again, he still met her when she was a young girl. And there's a bigger Jenny problem here conceptually, which is that her arrival just feels very tense from the beginning. The reason for this is that every single time two characters have met in this show, 
they have immediately fallen in love, or at the very least fallen into bed together. This is a show about people who literally can't keep their hands off of each other, and every time a new character enters, they immediately have some sort of a liaison with an existing character on stage. And that's happened throughout the first act, so by the time that we introduce a child into the mix, no one is prepared for anything kind of emotionally sincere. And while this song that Michael Ball sings to her about wanting to be the first man that she remembers as her father, while it ought to be parental love, one of the many aspects of love, because the whole show has just felt like aspects of lust up to this point, this song that he is singing to a young girl while dancing with her about wanting to be the first man she remembers, it just comes across in a very unfortunate way. That's all subtext and interpretation in a song that just kind of jars a little bit. But when Jenny and Alex then actually fall in love with each other, we end up in this completely uncomfortable place. I don't know if I have a fix for their relationship. Ultimately, I just don't know why this is something that you would be keen to adapt for the stage. And I don't think it plays well in 2023. I don't know how it played well in the 90s with her as a 15 year old. I just have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions about this particular plot point and how anyone can look past it. Am I being oversensitive? I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on this one in the comment section. And there's another change that this revival has made as well, because they have taken the song Love Changes Everything that was once sung by Alex and they have given it to George for the simple reason that people want Michael Ball to sing that song. Michael Ball singing that song became a huge part of the original production. It became this big hit on the radio, it was played everywhere. And the enduring memory of that show is Michael Ball singing Love Changes Everything. So pretty much the only reason this is getting revived is so that Michael Ball can sing that song in a full staged production. And it's novel to be able to hear him do it. However, I went to see him on tour doing a concert with my mother a few years ago, which is a lot of words for me to tell you that yes, I am gay. And he sang it as the encore in that and gave at the time a vocally stronger performance than the one he is giving now at the Lyric Theatre. So I had already ticked that off of my bucket list, having him sing that song. Hence, I arrived at this production at the Lyric, really wanting it to mean something in the context of the show. It wasn't enough for me that it was just fun to hear him sing it. And it really doesn't mean much where they've put it. If they are set on giving this song to George and not letting Alex sing it in full, which I think does Alex an injustice as a character because he is left without this amazing song through which to articulate his dramatic perspective on love in comparison with George, whose characterization doesn't really resonate with the dramatic lyrics, then George ought to come out during those early scenes when Alex is first trying to court Rose backstage at the theater and trying to convince her to go back with him to the villa. Or perhaps moments after they arrive at the villa when they're first falling for each other in that early madness of love. Michael Ball can come out as George, not really there, but just as this presence walking in from the darkness of the back of the stage and sing it while they are having their affair alongside him. He's just sort of underlining that moment. But no, instead he plays out this scene with Laura Pitt-Pulford. He turns to leave after seeing something else and then he sings the entirety of Love Changes Everything in the middle of that scene, just stood on the stage. It doesn't resonate with his character. He has a much more laid back perspective on love as this older man who has been married than Alex, who is this young, passionate man who is maddened by his love so much that he nearly shoots a woman. Sorry, actually does shoot a woman. But for many people, this is probably the highlight of their evening and why they're going to see the show in the first place. So I get that it's a difficult decision. And if you don't believe me, I have literally just noticed that they print the entirety of the lyrics to Love Changes Everything alongside a picture of Michael Ball. Are they expecting you to sing along? Is that the point of this? Is this like a hymn sheet in church? My goodness. So let's talk about the performances now. We have this quartet of actors who each have their great moments. Some give stronger performances than others. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. Ultimately, again, my issue here is that they do seem to be in four different shows. So you have Danielle Denise, who is this opera star. I saw her in It's a Wonderful Life at the English National Opera last year. She was fantastic. She has a glorious voice. She doesn't really get to utilize the full extents of it in this school, but there is a little bit of an operatic sense within this show and within her character, who is very passionate and dramatic. And I enjoy her performance function she only really exists in this show to sing about love and life. And when she does have this one little emotionally heavier moment in the second act while she's writing a letter to Rose, we're not really sure what it's about because there's not enough context within the script other than her just going, ugh, men. Let's talk about Michael Ball's performance. I enjoyed him as George. 
He brings an authority to the role. He brings a wisdom to it. He is believably agitated in the second act. I buy his affections for Laura Pitt Pulford's Rose. They have a believable chemistry. I also do enjoy the scenes that he had with Danielle Denise as Julieta. It's not a role that asks a tremendous amount for him and it's a really great fit for him at this point in his career because he can deliver both a strong acting performance and enough of the Michael Ball characterization that people are expecting from his real life persona. That's why a lot of people are buying tickets because they love him and they expect to see him on stage in a way that they recognize. Laura Pitt Pulford, probably the strongest of the four. I mean, she gets some really meaty, hysterical stuff to sink her teeth into. And this is not a characterization that is a million miles from anything that she's done before, but it is great getting to see her in a full West End production with a big picture of her outside the theater because this is what she has deserved for years. She has been giving incredible work in concerts and off West End and regional productions. I first saw her star-making turn as Mabel in Mac and Mabel at the Southwark Playhouse years ago, and she has been on the rise ever since. And if we can talk briefly about the highlight moment of the show, I'm going to say it here rather than in its own section, you might be expecting for me to talk about Michael Ball's Love Changes Everything. No, because of where they put it and because it doesn't really emerge from anything honest within his character, I don't think that really works on stage as much as Laura Pitt Pulford's rendition of Anything But Lonely. This is the defining moment of the show for me. This happens right at the end when she is hysterically begging Alex not to leave her just because she can't bear to be alone. She needs someone to give her daily gratification. And Laura Pitt Pulford, who gets a lot of the meat of the first act and then just sort of simmers throughout the second, comes to this magnificent boiling point when she sings this song. And she might bubble over just the little bit into melodrama when she is turning and screaming don't leave me at him and open-mouthed sobbing when he ultimately does. But it's an undeniably passionate and stirring performance of this song that she gives. I love someone singing with exceptional vocal prowess but also just putting so much heart and soul into what they are performing. The angst of it all catches in her voice and she is just pleading with him. It's really fantastic. Finally, we have Jamie Bogger. Now, I told you I bought into this relationship and this relationship, which gives you a sense of what I'm about to say, because Jamie Boggio, who I struggled to enjoy in Moulin Rouge because I thought he was a little bit uncharismatic, is unfortunately similarly uncharismatic in this role. I enjoy him more here because I think vocally he is more suited to this, although when he sings a mini reprise of The End of Love Changes Everything at the end of the first act, the last note still eludes his chest register. I should say when Michael Ball does it, it is several keys lower than the original version was. But Jamie commits to a characterization and he is giving you passion and indignance. I don't think he's helped by the fact that when he returns in the second act as a 30 year old, they gray all of his hair and give him this dreadful makeup beard. Like he's only 30 for context, I will be 30 in less than five years time and and thus far haven't gone fully gray. If anything, they would be much better off letting him look younger because then it wouldn't look like a creepy middle-aged man dancing with a child. But unfortunately, I just don't get sexual chemistry between Jamie Boggio and either of the women of the cast. And I think buying into this first relationship is really critical to the rest of the show working. It's the same issue that I had in Moulin Rouge. I just didn't buy into their relationship. Not only that, but there is one really conspicuous moment that I have alluded to and I absolutely have to talk about it. So again, this is going to be a massive spoiler for the second act of the show. If you don't want spoilers, skip ahead. I told you about Michael Ball's character George seeing Alex and Jenny kissing, having a heart attack and then dying on the floor. This happens and as these black shutters come in to surround them and close this moment before we transition seamlessly into a funeral, Jenny cries out with despair that she's just watched her father die, and Jamie Boggio says under his breath, it's my fault. And perhaps it's the material's fault, but the awkward delivery of this line by him gets a huge laugh from the audience, or at least it did at the opening night performance, which is not what this moment is going for, needless to say. This should be a sad moment. And everyone just erupts with laughter at the sight of this unfortunate, possibly incestuous couple crouching over the newly dead corpse of their father slash uncle slash ex-lover's husband. Up against all of this, how can a show like this actually work? <music> 
honestly, I'm struggling with who I can even pitch this show to. I don't think it's a particularly good date night for young couples or for married couples. Perhaps if you have fond memories of the original production or a very progressive view on relationships. I don't even think this is a great show to have an adulterous date night at. Honestly, go around the corner to Moulin Rouge. The score admittedly has an awful lot of strength in it. If you're a huge Michael Ball fan, then he gets to do a lot of Michael Ball in this show but there is just so much strangeness to it and so little of it really lands in the way that it's supposed to that ultimately, I think this is best seen ironically. Just like with Bad Cinderella on Broadway, if you are morbidly curious about this show, I would encourage you to go see it and believe it for yourself. Thank you so much for watching today's review of Aspects of Love. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to my stagey YouTube channel for plenty more reviews coming very soon. The other reviews for this production have been very split. There has been some love for this, there have been some one-star reviews from major publications, so I might end up doing a reviews roundup here on YouTube and talking about what some of the other critics have said. If that sounds like a video you would be interested in, uh, then comment down below. Let me know if that's something you'd like to see. Also, if you have been to see this production already, or if you have memories from a previous production, I would love to hear them. Let me know what you thought of Aspect of Love in the comment section down below. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>